So then you guys hook up with Lisa Lisa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And let me interject. Somewhere around there, Lou, we co-wrote basketball for Curtis Blow. Was that before that? Well, oh, be- way be- before everything. Well, way before. Way before Roxanne, Roxanne. And it's full force. Nobody knew us then. Right. We worked with Curtis Blow in the studio, and we uh-huh. did a lot of songs with him. We also co-wrote and played on the big hit basketball with Curtis Blow. Right. And we loved Curtis. Curtis was so down to earth with Took us. us on tour. We did like five yeah. or six songs with Curtis in the early going before um, UTFO. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing to backtrack, when Roxanne, when Roxanne Chante did Rock, Roxanne's Revenge, Molly Mall, didn't they do it on our original track, fellas? I don't even remember. No, I don't remember. Yeah, and in the beginning it was actually literally on our UTFO track itself, the record yeah. itself. They later changed it up, but um, that was funny. Yo, B, tell me about Lisa. Um, how Lisa came into effect is that you know, I wanted to, you know, find uh, a young Hispanic girl with flavor. Because at that time, the only thing popping was Menudo. And Menudo, to most, like, like, hip Hispanic cats that I hung out with in the handball court and on playing ball, I used to tease them. I said, yeah, well, yo, man, y'all still got Menudo. Yo, that ain't for me, man. That's my little sister. That's what they looked at that. <laughs> so all the brothers, Hispanic brothers and sisters, you know, um, that I grew up with, they had that flavor. They had that same street flavor. So Menudo was like, damn, that was what they was into. So I wanted to find that Hispanic girl with that same flavor. You know, we had some auditions, couldn't find it. And then Mike Hughes, who, who um, is in Cult Jam. But B, the song, your concept, it was written already. I wonder if yeah, I yeah, take yeah, you Yeah, yeah, yeah. The song was written already. The whole concept was pretty, you know, it was just find the person who was that. Right. It wasn't about creating it. You had to find somebody who was that. Right. And then when he brought um, Lisa, he said, maybe you want to check out this, this, this girl I found. We met her at the Fun House. Yeah, he met her at the Fun the, House. Back in the which day. Is, that was, was a good sign right off the bat. And when Lisa walked in right away, I said, she got that look. She got that look. She got that, that shit. She has it. Mm-hmm. And then she did this song that he wrote. Dear God, this Mike song was horrible. Yeah. Mike, I love you, but that song was horrible, man. <laughs> I still remember it. It was two dances, two love. Shit was terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. So then Paul said, yo, sing something you're comfortable with. She sung Sheena Easton's Three Eyes Only. And I was like, that's it. Because Lisa sounds like, like a young girl who could really sing good. You know, she just sounds like a young girl would say, yo, she sounds like me if I could really sing good, you know. And it took fire. It took fire. Right, because Wonder If I Take You Home was a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Still is. But what's interesting is when I was going through the discography, and I'm, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, Can You Feel the Beat was the song that in the Bay was like the huge, you know, the huge hit. I I don't know if it, it was as big as Wonder If I Take You Home. Where I'm from, that was the big hit. Right, right, yeah. It was like, I wonder if I Take You Home was big clubs and commercially, but on the underground circuit and the flavor, Can You Feel a Beat was like another trendsetter all its own. And I Definitely. think because Lisa was Hispanic, wouldn't you say, guys, that that was sort of the birth of freestyle? Because that's what they call freestyle when you're associating it yep. with the Latinos. When we came up with Take You Home, yeah. Can You Feel a Beat, being that Lisa Lisa was the first ever Hispanic, yeah. which was my brother B's idea that started. To, to do that, that's yeah, when yeah. the freestyle movement yeah. took, Lisa, took over. Lisa really took that whole scene on a national level. Because before Lisa, there was none. Because yeah. I remember looking in the marketplace going, yo, I don't see no Hispanic brothers and sisters like the way I know them. You know, and then Lisa was the first. Yeah. And can you feel the beat? You're right. That was a that was a, a big record. Many places, you know, from Take You Home, Can You Feel the Beat, All Cried Out. And, you know, we're just so proud to have wrote and all written and produced all her big hits yeah, you know, Je- as um, a team. Baby Jerry wrote Can You Feel the Beat? Because, yeah, at that time. Baby Jerry from Full See, Wonder If I Take You Home, I wrote that along with Kurt. But as a drummer, I was thinking different, but Can You Feel a Beat was just part of that mode. That's when producers like Arthur Baker and John Roby were out, and you had the Fun House, and you had the Club Roxy, where it was that upbeat dance music that people was like up rocking to and stuff like that. So we was really just trying to create a song that fit that marketplace, like Shannon's, you know, it was kind of like that. And it just took on life of its own because Lisa's voice was so, so different, it was so distinct that 
it became her. It really became her, yeah. Well, with the success of Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam, you guys finally were able to get your own deal. Yes. Huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Easily at that point. <laughs> Very <laughs> like, easily. Like, I mean, how big was Lisa Lisa? Like, how many times platinum were these uh, albums and singles going? Uh, at least went double platinum with Spanish Fly, I think. I think triple eventually. Yeah, yeah. You know? But the, the songs were even noisier than the sales. And the sales was great because, I mean, you know, yeah. from there, you know, it was like a phenomenon. I, I have to use the word phenomenon because after I wanted to take you home, you know, it was like, wow, what's this new flavor? Then when you drop Can You Feel the Beat, and then between that and Roxanne, Roxanne, there was a bidding war over the guys who created Lisa Lisa and Roxanne, Roxanne. You know, and it was a wonderful time. And then the thing about it is, after we hit them with that, just when they thought it was over, we dropped All Cried Out. And that just took it to a whole nother stratosphere. You know what? So I'm, I'm, it was phenomenal. I'm, I'm going to put myself on the limb out here. I'm going to say this. And a lot of people don't even know this. Russell Simmons might be mad, or I don't know. But back then, Russell was shopping Def Jam. He was shopping the label Def Jam. I believe he shopped Def Jam. I believe mm-hmm. he had Warner Brothers Warner close Brothers to it. And, yeah. and Warner Brothers couldn't understand hip hop. They didn't understand it at, at all. But Russell played them our stuff. Our stuff was a cross between R&B and hip hop. And it was easy to, easier to understand. And I'll never forget on the staircase at the Beacon Theater when Run DMC was headlining, when, Run, when Russell was saying to me, he saying, yo, man, yo, I mean, just come with me over there to, um, you know, the Def Jam and Warner Brothers, man. Yo, I just want a little say about the music, man. You guys could do your own thing. But what happened is that Steve kind of wanted to create our own type of thing, you know. Oh, I, I look back at that and I'm like, you know, we should have came with you, Russ! <laughs> See, you guys could have been on Def Jam. Yeah, well, well actually, to backtrack, Steve Salem and, uh, and Russell Simmons, they were close friends. Right. And they shared an office together. Yeah, they were real tight. And that's why we were close with Run, and that's why we did Crush Groove together, and Curtis Blow, because it was all like one knit pack. So when they went to shop the deal, you know, Rick Rubin went with Beastie Boys, LL, and Full Force. That's how we shot for Def Jam, because I got a call from Tom Draper and Mo Austin, Lenny Warnka at the Brothers. time, Warner Brothers, right. And later on, we said, well, no, we're our own thing, but we're all, we was all cool, you know what I mean? So that was some more history back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was a great time. It was all good. <laughs> you guys get your solo deal, and you come out with Alice, I Just Want You For Me, which a lot of people say is the first New Jack Swing record. Which, you know, later on, Teddy Riley went and kind of ran with that. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But yeah. Well, you guys kind of originated that style. We were, I would say we were definitely, if not the first, one of the first to bring that out because we hit that home. And in the, back in the day, it was all family because it's funny. Back in the day, we was always full force. But some of the competing groups was a group called Kids at Work, which featured this young kid named Teddy Riley. Then there was Jamila, which featured this other brother named Keith, Keith Sweat. Sweat. So we all started up together. When Alice came, you know, and much love to Hitman Howie T. Hitman Howie I T. I remember yeah. that one. I, I was, we'd always work together. And I went by Howie's basement, and I heard him playing this beat. And I just heard, doom, 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 doom. I said, Howie, what's that? He said, yo, I just created it. I said, Howie, that sounds like Alice. He's like, Alice, what's that? And I said, never mind, keep going. You know, because I was a honeymooners fanatic. Everything for me was honeymooners, honeymooners. And I'm like, then I start. I, I wrote that song, it had to be in 20 minutes. 20 minutes, because the beat just spoke to me, you know. Said, Howie T yeah. is definitely most, yeah. one of the most underrated hip hop producers Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. That's Way how Alice. ahead of his time. And that became a a big top 20 record for us on the R&B charts. And and it was like top 10 in England and Germany and Holland. It was was crazy. So later on, you had people like 50 Cent and LL Cool J that would really sell kind of male sex appeal, right? They would be have their shirts off. They'd be greased up, whatever. But you guys were the first ones to actually do all that. Yes, yeah, indeed. Man. In the urban hip hop space. Yes, right, and right. spearheaded by um, our brother Paul Anthony from the very beginning um, mm-hmm. of showing our skin. And Paul had the headbands. We had Jerry curls, and that's why everybody always related to Jerry curls and us showing our skin and working out. Paul actually pushed that 
push that whole scenario. Yeah, yeah. No one was doing that before us, you know. And I, I, I'm always an extremist. You know, my brothers call me extra. So, you know, back then I followed groups like Motley Crue, Rat, you know, uh, Van Halen. And that's why I dressed with all the stuff and the makeup. And it's so funny. Back then, <clears throat> I remember putting an earring in my right ear. Okay? And I remember my younger brother, B, said, Yo, Paul, yeah. what are you doing, man? <laughs> Mike was an earring in the right ear. That means you're gay. What does that mean? I'm like... <laughs> I know the dudes I'm rocking with, with Motley Crue and them, they put earrings everywhere. I'm rocking this. And years later, you see what happens. But no one was taking it all <laughs> off and pulling it down. Oh, and, yeah, and on our tours. Nobody was doing that because I worked out all the time. We all worked out, but that was like my main thing. So on tour, forget about it. You know, we would be, they would follow by the thousands to watch what color I'm going to wear as we stripped and posed and well, did Paul all that. Well, Paul would strip you know? every night of our show. Yeah. He yeah. would take off his top. And then we say, ladies, how many of you like to see Paul Anthony pull it down? He'd pull the bad boy down. He'd be wearing different colored G-strings. Sometimes that glow, glowed in the dark. And you know, so funny, even though we had the Jerry curls yeah. and all of that stuff and all the hip hop is always respected full force. Right, because they knew the real. Always they respected full force. They knew the real. Because no matter what, we was no, no punk motherfuckers either. You know what right. I'm saying? And I'll never forget Fat Man Scoop coming up to me and saying, yo, man, Back in the day, not even the hardest hip hop nigga would ever approach y'all or say anything. We had nothing but respect for full force. Right. Do you want to tell the Larry, Larry uh, Blackman story from Cameo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We was and, on tour with Larry Blackman yeah. and Cameo. Take it from there. Yeah, because we did all kind of different tours, <laughs> pop, this, but we was always real. We, we was gracious, but, you know, we're Brooklyn all day. Um, I remember one time we got a call from our agent, you know, much love, Mark Siegel, mm. ICM, and he said, hey, Paul, man. I got a great tour for you guys, man. But the problem is, you know, Larry Blackman, they've been terrorizing all the opening acts, man. Yeah, yeah. Jesse Johnson, Teen Marie, Andrew. They shut the lights out of Vert. Because they're raw yeah. like that. And I'm like, well, first of all, all I know is I'm a huge cameo fan. I'm right. like, I'm down. How much they paying? Oh, psh, let's do it. You know, because we didn't fear that. We was like, I just enamored that I'm going to be with cameo. And you got to remember, yeah. our whole crew. Was from our block. <laughs> our whole crew is Brooklyn. Right. right we trained home. our crew. Yeah. Right. right so right. when they're about to go with us, say, "Yo, here's the deal. There might be some static. Might be some, you know, a little violence like that." They're like, "All right." So that was that wasn't even in our thought. We yeah, we didn't have a good time, you know. So make a long story short, um, you know, every time we would do our show, we just had us cameo. You know, we were the opening act, but Cameo had, you know, he had his red card, he had the coffin, he had hits upon hits that upon word hits. up, candy. But we were the opening act. By the time we finished, we drained the crowd with our show, our songs, our showmanship, pulling it down, the Alice sandwich. Oh, you had an Alice sandwich. I would, I would take a young lady in the middle, I would take Lou, and I'd pick Lou and, and the lady off their up. feet and dragging them, you know. For me, it was just like deadlifting, but I, it just looked spectac oh, like I spectacular. Lo I loved it. <laughs> it was off the chain, though. Oh, yeah. And um, we got a call from the promoter, and he said, listen, he came to us here, I, I want to talk to you guys. Listen, um, Larry Backman says uh, he doesn't want Not any more. Not a call, he came into he our came. dressing room. Right, he said, we don't want you taking your pants down anymore, and then that Alice sandwich, you got to cut it out the show. And I said, he said Larry Blackman said that. Yeah. And we said, well, listen, please tell Larry that first of all, we're the most biggest cameo fans. We mean no disrespect. It's just part of our show. And we'd like to tell him that respectfully. Can we talk uh, to him? And he said, um, sorry, but Larry yeah, doesn't talk to the opening that. acts. Remember that. And uh, so now the change comes. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Tell Larry, I said, F you. And tomorrow night, I'm wearing yellow in his honor. You know, and sure enough, the whole complexion changed from everybody. To we started kicking the equipment and just waiting for anything to go down. And sure enough, water, yellow, poses, this and that. And it was cool. After that, it was love. To this day, it's very much love because sometimes you have to go there. But that's just one of many episodes, you know. Oh, we love them, man. But, you know, we had to show that side. At the and time. once again, this was the promoter telling us it's allegedly that he said Larry Blackman said that. Right. We okay. don't know, you know, but... Ain't talking. Okay. Yeah.